Hello guys and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to take a look at somewhat of an oddity of a machine, this Amstrad PPC 512 from 1988. Now this is a machine that Amstrad released in an attempt to get in on the growing PC portable market and this is where it gets slightly odd. This is admittedly before my time, I was only four when this thing came out, but it's designed to be compatible with the original IBM PC. It has an NEC V30 processor which is fully compatible with the Intel 8088, but that IBM PC came out in 1981, seven years before this model hit shelves. In fact, the Intel 386 had already been out for nearly three years when this thing came to market, and only a year later the 486 would come out. So no matter which way you look at this, it was massively out of date when it was released. And it's not like it even can claim to be groundbreaking for being portable. The Compact Portable came out five years before this thing did. In fact, the third iteration of Compact's offering, which featured far superior specs, came out the year before in 1987, so what's the angle here? Well, this is an Amstrad after all, so let's say price. From what I've been able to gather, this was designed to be a portable version of the Amstrad PC 1512, a budget IBM compatible that Amstrad released in 1986 at a bargain price of £499. I've not been able to find any UK pricing for the PPC range, but it looks like it was released in the US for $799, or just shy of two grand in today's money. That's still significantly cheaper than other portable solutions at the time. The Compact Portable 3 cost over $3,000 at launch, making the Amstrad a much more palatable option as long as your requirements weren't too demanding. That's the why taken care of, let's look at the what in more detail. This particular unit has come to me from a young man named Chris. He'd inherited it from his grandfather, who was the original owner, although, as will become clear, the subject of ownership is a tricky one to define. Chris's grandfather worked in the 1980s for a company called Comet, who UK viewers might recognise as being formerly one of the biggest electronic retailers we had, right up until their collapse in 2012. He worked in their product evaluation team at their headquarters in Hull, and it was his job to review new products that were coming to market to see if they were worth stocking. As you might have guessed at this point, this is the review unit that Amstrad sent to Comet for evaluation prior to them going on general sale. And as Comet were, at the time, one of the largest retailers of electronics in the UK, it stands to reason that this would be a very early example of the PPC 512. The question of ownership revolves around what happened next. It seems that for whatever reason Amstrad didn't ask for this unit back, so it went home with Chris's grandfather and at some point was likely shoved in an attic or garage before it eventually fell into Chris's hands. It looks like I've got more or less a complete setup here. We've got the unit itself, which is shrouded in this soft carry case, which admittedly needs a bit of a clean. I like that the handle of the device is still used when it's inside the case. It's testament to Amstrad's low cost ethos and I think it works really well. In the larger side pocket you've got the original mains power supply. This chucks out 13 volts and can supply 1.9 amps as required by the unit. Ooh, this one still has the protective film on the label. Excuse me one moment. Round to the smaller side pocket we have the in-car charger, which I suspect is just a small 12 volt DC regulator inside of this connector for the cigarette lighter. In the bottom front pocket we have the original manual, which is rather chunky at over 300 pages, but I suspect we'll find an excuse to look into that later in the video. We've also got these printed instructions for a game called Galaxy, but no disc to speak of for the software itself. 
In the top pocket, you've got space for a smattering of 720 kilobyte floppy disks, and it looks like that we've got a boot disk for IBM DOS, and yeah, yep, there's that disk for the Galaxy software as well. The PPC itself has a somewhat unusual look to it. It's rather long and slender when you compare it to other portables of the time. I like the two-tone colour scheme that Amstrad went with here, and from looking at pictures online, I don't think this one has discoloured too much, so I won't be looking to retrobrite it. The machine opens up in a rather haphazard way. Other portables of the time relied on a fold-down keyboard attached to the base of the unit, whereas this unit opens more or less down the middle to reveal the keyboard in the base and the screen and disk drives in the top. The screen then articulates upward and can be put in a variety of angles to suit the user. It's an interesting design, and you could argue that it's an important evolutionary step towards what would commonly become known as a laptop not long after this. One thing that immediately strikes me though is how cheaply made this feels. It creaks pretty much every time you touch it, just listen. That's an almost impressive level of creak achieved, and I'm not alone in finding it somewhat worrying. In researching for this video, I found a retrospective blog post featuring an original review from which PC, where the author commented how the Amstrad made an absolute racket when handled, and was probably the cheapest feeling computer he'd ever encountered. That's not exactly high praise, but the article does go on to say that he liked the compact design overall, and it was only the lacklustre display that would prevent him from buying it. Ah yes, that display. We'll get to that. First, let's have a closer look at the unit itself. You've seen the keyboard already, it actually feels quite nice to type on. Though I suspect it's not a true mechanical unit, it feels more like a rubber dome one to me. It's connected to the base of the machine via this ribbon cable here, which feels very much like a weak design, given how it has to flex each time the unit is opened, but fingers crossed this one looks okay. Because of the design, there's also no height adjustment on the board, which would have affected its desirability in the professional workspace. Still, the hinges connected to the base feel really solid. Moving up to the top section, you've got the 8-inch super to a screen here on the left. It's a black on green LCD display with no backlighting to speak of, Think uh, original Nintendo Game Boy screen, and you're very close to what we're talking about in terms of technology, just a bit bigger here. This screen can display in MDA monochrome mode, but it'll also make an attempt at displaying in CGA mode as well, though obviously only in shades of grey rather than a true CGA colour palette. Next to that, there's a small concealment hatch, which on this model does nothing. On the PPC640, this section contained the cable for the included modem. The modem and the amount of RAM installed were the only two differences between this model and the PPC640. Well, that and the colour. Below that, you've got some dials and switches. The two dials control the contrast of the built-in screen and the volume of the PC speaker. Then you've got some status LEDs for drive access, power and external monitor, and then this switch underneath, which essentially is a power switch. Though, in reality, there technically is no power switch. This just selects whether you're powered from the external supply or from batteries. Ah, yes, uh, I should mention, it is possible technically to power this thing from batteries. It's just that you need 10 C-cell alkaline batteries, and at best you'll only get about an hour's use. Quite why anyone thought this was a good idea is beyond me. I'd have much rather had a slightly more compact unit and accepted that it could only be powered externally, or a more expensive unit which included a proper built-in battery. This half measure does nothing from a mobility standpoint, unless you were prepared to walk around with a backpack full of C-cells and were willing to shut it down once an hour to swap out the batteries. It really makes no sense. Moving on, and the rest of the top part of the case is taken up by the two 720kb disk drives. 
There's no hard drive to speak of in this machine, so it makes sense to have two drives, one to boot the DOS and load applications, and another to save files when needed. There was another version available which only had a single drive, but I'd imagine that most would opt for the dual unit as shown here. Around to the other side there's the PC speaker, and then this bank of dip switches here. These are for setting the graphics mode of the machine between CGA and MDA, and also you can use these to determine whether the built-in display will be used or a compatible external monitor. Yep, it's not the case that this thing can auto-detect whether or not it has a monitor connected. You literally have to reset these every time you want to change between internal and external displays, and to make matters worse, you have to do it with the power off. Beginning to see why this thing wasn't the success that Amstrad had hoped for at this point. Round to the back we have a fair assortment of I.O. behind this drop down shield. Starting at the right you've got the 9 pin connector for an external monochrome or CGA monitor. Next to that you've got a standard parallel and 25 pin serial port. Then things get a bit weird. These two additional D type ports here are labelled up as expansion A and B, and as it turns out they're basically the pins for the ISA bus remapped onto D type connectors. I suspect that Amstrad intended to release a series of expansion modules for this device like a hard disk unit, but for whatever reason it seems that just never happened. That said, I've got plans for these ports, so make sure you get subscribed, it's going to be fun. Above those connectors you have the DC input jack along with another DIN type port for monitor derived power. You could plug in an Amstrad monitor here, and it would also power the PC as well as generating the signal for the display. Neat. Lastly on the back you have this blanking panel. On the 640 kilobyte model this contains the RJ11 jack for the included modem, but on most if not all PPC 512s it's left blank. Overall this unit seems to be in amazing condition for its age, so I'm just going to give it a quick clean with a paper towel and call it a day. Nothing else to do now but stick that boot disc in and turn it on. Oh, um, that's not good. The display turns on briefly, but then goes blank, and all we get are three short beeps from the PC speaker. It looks like the system is booting, there's plenty of floppy drive access going on, but nothing outwardly appears to be happening. I told you we'd be needing that manual. It turns out whoever had used this last had changed the dip switches so that the system was sending the video signal to the DB9 connector on the back. So turn the unit back off and then sorting out these pin switches and we should be able to boot up with the internal display. Yep, there we go. That is just awesome. I love the look of that little green display though I'm sure if I had to use it every day I'd probably grow less keen of it. It's heavily dependent on the surrounding light levels, and to get these shots I've had to basically shine one of my filming lights directly at it. It'd be alright in a well lit office, but in say, a dimly lit kitchen, it's a lot less easy to see things clearly. Back in the workspace and DOS 3.3 boots straight up from the included floppy disk, though annoyingly that disk labelled Galaxy just doesn't want to work. It reads just fine, but the game just fails to load and gives a read error. One game that I know will work is Prince of Persia. Knowles Retro Lab did a great series replacing the mono LCD with a modern HDMI monitor on one of these, and he demoed this game while doing that. The internal display does a decent enough job of emulating a colour CGA palette in monochrome, and it doesn't look half bad if you can surround yourself with enough light to play. It definitely reminds me of the original Game Boy, though I don't think there's a clip on light module for the PPC 512. So let's look and see whether we can get better results with an external monitor. I don't have a CGA capable monitor to hand unfortunately, but I do have this MDA Amber Mono display. I just need to change the pin switches to expect an external MDA monitor, and voila, it works just fine and looks great to boot.
It's true it limits me somewhat to what I can display on this external monitor. It can't work any CJ emulation trickery like the internal display, but it's much more readable for software which only displays in monochrome. So I guess text adventures are the way forward? There are options for converting the CJ output of this machine to a modern monitor, which Noel evaluated in his excellent series of videos, but I'm going to have to have a think about those, so we'll leave it here for now. In the next video in this series, we're going to be looking at some upgrades to this machine, including seeing if we can use those expansion connectors to add some permanent hard disk storage. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that video, and in the meantime, I hope you've enjoyed this look at the Amstrad PPC 512. I also hope you'll consider liking this video, and please feel free to drop me a comment below if you've got any ideas on what I should do with this machine. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.